I like Park City. The best thing I like about it is doing, you get to do two interviews at once, you know. Other states, it's just one interview at a time. Here, it's minimum two. It's great, you know. And, uh, yeah, it's nice. Some people get cold, but those are all the L.A. people. They're all wimps, you know. They, it gets to be 50 degrees and they're shivering, you know. Got to be tough to come to Park City. Some of the best people I've ever met are here at the Sundance Film Festival in 2005. Um, and here's to everyone and their efforts to make this happen. Did you hear that slur? You know, as a painter, I'm just like, I like to get my finger on like the texture of American culture because I like the fact that Sundance you know, has so many unseen films. It's a, a very kind of artistic. Of, of cinema. For me to be at Sundance 05 is to to network. It's my first time ever being here in Park City. Uh, first time ever obviously being here at Sundance and I'm just going to be out here working it. It's Park City, Utah. You know what I mean? Like where else in Utah are we going to get like a bunch of celebrities to show up at one place? And so we get them for a week so we should treat them right, you know? And it's like, so they they shove us in a corral and they shove them in a corral so it's kind of like a zoo, you know, and you're, you're not allowed to, you know, uh, feed the animals or anything like that, but you can take pictures of the animals. And Sundance is such a great festival and, you know, um, it means everything to every movie and especially to us independents who work so hard to try to get here. Yeah. It's a great good, networking place, yeah. you know. Great you networking get opportunity. Get their, get their movie show. You know, you, you, there's a potential to have a casual conversation with somebody standing in line, you know what I mean, that could change your life. I'm here to support the Memphis people and hand out cards touting a new movie called Cadavra about a girl made from the parts of dead movie stars that I want to do, trying to raise money and raise consciousness. I'm a producer of a short film called Tamatu, written and directed by Taika Waititi, and um, his first features in development at Sundance as well. We get the actors, the directors, the DPs, you know, everybody for the film lab. It's pretty cool. I think especially if you write your own material, there's that delight in, in, in inventing and in the invention of the characters and creating the something out of nothing, the first step that is from blank page to screenplay. I think that's incredibly delightful. Yeah, Tamatu's in the short film uh, competition. And it's about um, these kids in high school, based on my own experiences in high school. And uh, this is the first time I was at Sundance. Well, we're part of a production company called Real Kids Films, where we uh, we team up teenagers and establish film the producers, makers. filmmakers, to make films that will make the world a better place. And we're yes. here to promote and build our team and just enjoy Sundance. Yeah, and show everyone that we can do it too. Strangers are being kind to us. We're getting we're getting rides. It's 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 kind of like a a, a variation on hitchhiking. I stand up at the Continental Breakfast at the Hojo and announce that we need a ride to Park City and then nobody seems to look at us or say anything and then eventually someone might come up and go get in the car which is as dangerous for us as it is for them more than likely. So people respond really well to his short films and hopefully then people will want to um, help us make his feature films as well. So we basically slept in a minivan for three days handed out cards everywhere, and unfortunately we haven't had time to see a single movie here at Sundance this year. And I directed a short film that's made it into Sundance and it's called Motel. Short you could best describe as if Rod Serling and Gary Larson got together and made a short. So this is just really exciting, to because we've been working on this for three years, and now this in a couple hours it's going to be the first time that, that people watch it who aren't our friends who have to say they like it. Our first screening was really terrific. People were laughing and cheering and applauding, so, um, and I'm thrilled. I mean, that's the, that's the greatest feeling of, like, something that you sort of were locked up for a long time, toiling away, and always wondering, uh, you know, is this 
is this going to even function when it's done? And now to see it with people, you know, reacting to it, thousands of people actually, uh, it's quite something. Uh, that's good. We're from the South. We're a little overly friendly. You know what I mean? What are you doing later? In American Splendor, I played a nerd, and that's what they call in show business range. That's what they call casting against type. You know, because usually I play some kind of sex god or something that's just, you know, getting laid constantly. And, uh, you know, decided to stretch and show people what I can do in that film. And the coolest thing is the fact that everybody that's there loves to do what they do. My job is once the festival starts is to make sure that every single print gets to every single venue. And there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three. There are 24 screens individually during and throughout Sundance. Each day there are between 80 to 106 individual screenings that run 350 square miles in the state of Utah with Park City being the epicenter. The 10 print runners that work uh, for the film festival are really the cream of the crop of all volunteers. These guys um, uh, have to go take these individual 35 millimeter prints that could be way up to you know 50, 60 pounds and take two or three of them through the crowds, through the snow, up the stairs in a darkened theater and then back down again and they sometimes have to hustle. We're the best. <laughs> <laughs> We're print runners. We are the print department. There's all kinds of things that we have to do to maintain the control in here. and We have to keep it clean, keep it somewhat tidy because of, uh, you know, the prints are very fragile. You know, these are people's dreams that we handle. Um, millions of dollars in film. The film itself, you know, each print could be between a thousand and four thousand dollars. And the millions of dollars that goes into them, and of course, the potential for somebody to become either a millionaire or, you know, the filmmaker that's going to be somebody that we know from here on out, you know, like Quentin Tarantino or Steven Soderbergh or, um, well, you name it, you know, they've all come through here. Really rewarding. I'd save up all my vacation from work so I can, I can come to the festival. It's great. I drove three days, in fact. We went through Missouri, uh, Kansas, Colorado and Utah. I have one runner by the name of Curtis Burr who is sort of a genius psycho. I don't know how the hell he does it, but he is able to literally, I gave him a run one time of about 40 prints and he wanted to go see this movie at 9 o'clock and he said he was going to do it. 45 minutes later he comes in and says he's done and damn if he wasn't and every one of them spot on. Back in the day, I'll tell you a story as soon as we're done here. The Coen brothers were supposed to screen The Big Lebowski, and it was before it had come out in theaters. And so it was supposed to happen at, I think, like 1.30 in the afternoon and around noon. The one brother looked at the other brother, and the producer looked at both of them and said, where the hell is the print? They, can't, they realized that it was at, uh, still back at Gramercy in L.A. So they called up one of the vice presidents at Gramercy, and they asked him, you know, what are you doing tonight? And he's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to whatever uh, wards deal they have you know that coincides perfectly with Sundance with like the first week of Sundance and um, they're like well that's nice and all but we've got a Learjet waiting out at Van Nuys and uh, you need to run back to the office grab the print of the Big Lebowski that's sitting there and hop on that Learjet it just opens up some doors being able to do the in the print department uh, being able to get into places and um, the projectionists and the other people that are involved it's they're all really uh, great nice people so it's a great group to hang out with the revisionists bill hill and their their crew i always like to tell the story because everybody's all the filmmakers are concerned if we mess up their screening that we've ruined their career or their multi-million dollar deal there's one year ron montgomery our technical director died in the middle of the festival suddenly we were all shocked the American movie 16 millimeter. it showed at the holiday that evening, not many hours after our tech director had died. And the 16 millimeter, it uh, stuck in the gate of this old Hortzen projector that we had and burnt a hole in the film. We had to stop and 
started over again and the heating ducts from the holiday fell out of the ceiling onto the audience, uh, knocked someone cold and an ambulance had to come and take the guy away. We of course had to stop the movie again and uh, finally got it rolling again and the filmmaker sold his film that night for a multi-million dollar deal. And then my boss told me, that he's like, Curtis, you know, as fast as you want to drive, if you're willing to, you know, drive that fast, I'm willing to pay the ticket. So I cruise over and I wait literally on the tarmac. The Learjet arrives, the guy comes tumbling out, we throw the prince in the back, we throw him in the back, I go screaming 120 miles an hour, back over. And by this time it's like 1.30, the time it's supposed to screen, because it came out in those thousand foot reels. They still had to build it up. They're, they're works that have just barely been finished. Just the wet coming out of the lab. We took and we built that up, and by this time it was like 45 minutes late. And uh, I took and threw it in the back, went running over there, and there's about 300 people milling around um, in the foyer at the Eccles. And when they saw me come running in with the print, everybody started to applaud. It was hilarious. I ran it upstairs, and um, that's the story of the big Lebowski at Sundance and the answer to your question. The Blair Witch Project was bought. The kids that were made it, uh, Ed Meyer, whatever their names are, the, the two kids, they were living on their couch. They had, the electricity was turned off. They had nothing going for them. They had a midnight screening and all this hype built up in this film. Nobody, it was a feeding frenzy, but artisans stepped in and said, we'll give you a million dollars for this film. Starving artist, a million dollars sounds like a lot of money. Okay, so they took the million dollars. Ended up making $244 million. I haven't seen anything. It's been partying nonstop, hooking up with a lot of chicks. It's been great. I've made out with almost every female celebrity here. It's been cool. Yeah, I brought up t-shirts to give to celebrities. I ask them, I say, will you be my friend? And if they say yes, I hand them a t-shirt that says, Skip, here, I'll hold it up. It says, Skippy is my pudgy, little sexy, because I'm a little sexy, not a lot. Uh, Mormon Caucasian friend. And then on the back is my email address, which is, uh, Bishop, I am not gay at hotmail.com. And I've gotten a couple of them to keep it. Um, Joseph Gordon Levitt has one. Shannon Doherty has one. Uh, Tom Arnold has a t shirt saying that he'll be my friend. We're trying to meet famous people. Oh, God. And, like, um, I wasn't saying I was against paparazzi, but, like, <laughs> I felt kind of bad because, like, yeah. I've been taking pictures of famous people the past couple of years and I felt really kind of mean. I held out my camera and then he grabbed onto it too. So the both of us are holding on to the camera and we got this picture and Kevin Bacon rules. Um, I will say uh, I'm running late and uh, I'll go real slow. I'll open the door and you can jump out. That'll save us both a lot of time. I think I'm going to try and pick up a famous actress chick, get photographed a little bit and, and then turn up in like variety or something. <laughs> my, my career will just shoot off from there. One of the dumbest pictures I've ever taken, but how cute is she? Seriously, the only hurdle in our relationship is that she doesn't know me. If she knew me, she might like me, and if she liked me, we might be married. That's pretty much the only hurdle between me and Kieran Knightley's marriage. Shannon Doherty has one of my t-shirts, and she was way sweet, so, you know, she's got a boyfriend, but still, you know, there's always a chance. So, uh... Who knows? Wanna go to New York, wanna go to LA, wanna go to Hollywood, wanna be a punk star, wanna be a rock star, wanna be a punk rock star. Why hand your camera to someone if they're gonna cut off David Schwimmer's head? That's so rude. Meryl Streep was here. She was hot. That was cool. Her husband got pissed, but whatever, you know, it's showbiz. You know? That's the way I do it. I said, Hey, Alice, I'm Mormon too. And he goes, well, that makes one of us. It's not just a matter of showing up with a camera and saying, I want to talk to Robert Redford. And, you know, it's like going to the White House and say, I want to talk to the president. It just really isn't going to happen. I came in here knowing, not knowing that Robert Redford was speaking, uh, found out as I walked up the stairs, ran in, stood up on top of a chair as fast as I could and snapped off as many head shots as I can. They probably won't be used because their editor has to go through and approve every image of Robert Redford at Sundance Film Festival. And they have to be really particular about that look. You know that Robert Redford look that you get? It's like, I don't know how to do it, but he's got that look. So we're sort of on the side of not only keeping alive, but maybe even creating platforms for alternative views. As long as they 
they fit into a certain criteria of uh, the courage of the filmmaker to have their voice maintain its independence, but to keep in mind that the best stories are ones that have stories at their heart. Yes, Times Like These Again is a wonderful uh, story. It was uh, inspired by To Kill a Mockingbird. It's an urban tale of these five teenagers that on the surface think that they're very different, and they go through this very tumultuous sort of you know growth arc, only to find out at the end that they all, at the ba mo most basic human level, are all looking for the exact same thing, validation. Yeah, we're actually working on a sequel to American Splendor called Canadian Splendor, and uh, we're gonna film it all up in Saskatchewan. It's gonna be great. It's all gonna be underwater. It's gonna be great. The movie's gonna start on the ice on a lake, and they're gonna break it, and then it just goes to underwater for the whole movie. It's gonna be a real breakthrough. It's gonna be the first independent film about a comic book writer from Cleveland all shot underwater in Canada. And so this imagery-oriented dialogue doesn't really spell it all out for the person. They have to do a little work in order to see what's, what the end really means. So we had somebody raise their hand and kind of, with a little trepidation, say, did you mean this? And it was exactly what we meant, and it was just very gratifying that people were asking these questions that were spot on and very insightful. You know, having Seems someone write us a check for a couple million bucks. <laughs> yeah. Is that so wrong? Are you, you going to be able to come to any of the screenings? Gorilla Monster, we've been doing films in Memphis for 10 years, longer than anybody else and uh, in Memphis. And our three rules are don't ask permission, shoot until they make you stop, and deny everything. Why can't there just be parties where people are cool and then like leave and, you know, enjoy their time in Utah and, I don't know, have some jello and take a Book of Mormon with you on your way out, you know? We love it here. And, every, and everyone here comes here for the same reasons, because we all have a passion for film and movies and all of it. So, yeah, we're just, we're happy to be here in at the atmosphere, so. Yeah. <laughs> We've been having a very successful weekend and, you know, if there's anybody seeing this as a filmmaker or, um, you know, a film lover or someone that believes in, you know, social justice and kids and making the world a better place and building, you know, global community, please contact us. Real Kids Film. Just one life In a world that keeps on pushing me around I'm gonna stand my ground And I won't back down I want the hey, baby There ain't no easy way out I want the hey, yeah Gonna stand You have to read this script. It's going to make you 50, 60 million dollars in the first week. All right? It's called Werewolf in Paris. It's beautiful. It's an artistic masterpiece. My grandma loves it. My sister loves it. My dogs love it. My turtle cannot believe I created this masterpiece. You have to read this. It will change your life.